All right, good morning. I'm, I was at the Mariners game yesterday, and each guy has walk-up music. So is that my walk-up music? How you good? Oh, I would have picked something different, I guess. Okay, like I said, my name is Ryan, and uh, I'm coming down from Bellingham, and uh, I ended up at the church where your pastor, George, was a middle school kid when I got there, and his dad was the pastor, and so I was a helper in the youth group, and eventually became the youth pastor there, and George was in the youth group. And then George came on staff and led our youth group for a while. So you have a great pastor. I have a long history with George, and I keep up with what's happening down here. And when we talk periodically and meet at different conferences, so I'm so excited about Whitewater and how it's grown from a few of you. Anybody here from the beginning when it was meeting at a school in, what, Fredrickson? Frederick? Yeah, a few of you. Good. So, uh, but it's always fun to kind of reminisce. George had some different eras growing up. You know, there's kind of the cool era and maybe a sports era and then the mature college student era. But there was this brief window when he had the 90s rocker era. So let's, let me just show you that so you just have a sense of this. Um, did it go? There we go. So there's George in his mullet days and uh, rocker George. So you can uh, remember that pre-beard. The, sound, the tech team has that photo, so if you in the future need blackmail material, George has got it, or they've got it of George. So anyways, George is a good sport. If he's ever teased you, you know it's hard to get ahead of George a little bit, so you got to take him when you can, George. Okay. So we, we, <laughs> I violated the deal. Okay. That's not really why I was here to show a f- photo book of George. Um, we're here to, he asked me to talk about joy. Talk about joy today. And it's, as you saw the clip, this idea of a fuller life, a full life, and joy is a huge part of that. What does it mean to be joyful? We're going to talk about that today. What does it mean to live a joyful life? Uh, what does that look like? Are we talking about the hyper person that works next to you that's over caffeinated as a morning person? That's not, that's not where we're going. Okay, we're not talking about someone that's just really at your door trying to sell you something. That's not what we're talking about. We're going to talk about what is this idea of joy? How does it work in our life? And how do we get, get it into this whole idea of a fuller life with joy? And a lot of times when you're trying to figure what something is, you can understand it by what it isn't. So maybe it's hard to put your finger on joy and who's a joyful person versus a hyper person, but you can usually spot when someone is not, when someone is uh, bitter, when someone is resentful, when someone's not joyful. Anybody work with any of those people? They're angry about life and they're angry about the day. They're angry about everything. They're just, they're bitter. So we can, let's start with what isn't joy, what's not joy. And um, I've had the cops called on me two times. And both times were related to landscaping. So my criminal, but, but uh, one of them, in my neighborhood up in Billingham, we have a, uh, there's a, a lady lives on the corner, a, a widowed lady, and she's, you know, kind of isolated, and she always has a really scary dog. In fact, the dog would get away. When we first moved in, I just heard this car driving and honking incessantly, and I just stood out in front of it, kind of all bowed up, like, what? And this lady gets out, and then the dog came and jumped in the car. It's like, that's how you call your dog, by honking in the night? But, uh, but it's, they're terrifying dogs, so everyone's kind of afraid of it. But she lives by herself. She's really lonely and kind of grumpy. And, and so one of the things we try to reach out to our neighborhood, so I started mowing her lawn. It's a teeny, I mean, the lawn's barely bigger than this stage that I'm on. And so just trying to do that, she asked me once, you want to get paid for this? And I was like, no, I have a job. I'm just, just mowing your lawn. And uh, so anyway, that, that's just for this lady in our neighborhood. But one day... We were getting ready for Easter, and we do a neighborhood Easter egg hunt for all the kids. We have a ton of kids. We live right next to an elementary school. Uh, most people on our street have a three to five. One of our neighbors is going to have number six here pretty quick. So we've got tons of kids on our street. And um, I'm setting up for an Easter egg hunt. And this area we do, this kind of common area, had a long strip of these bushes that were planted on purpose, but they had big briars and thorns. And it's like, what? The builder must have found a sale on these things because they were not weeds. They were supposed to be there. But the kids would go through for Easter egg hunt and just get shredded and like hate Easter. And I got an egg, but I'm bleeding and need a band-aid. So 
I decide I'm just going to tear, I'm going to, I'm going to tear these bushes out. It's a common area. So I'm down there and it's right near her house. And I just start ripping these in there, you know, about this high, ripping them up, throwing them in the back of my truck. And, and this lady comes out. She's like, what are you, what are you doing? So I'm just tearing out these bushes. We're having an uh, egg hunt tomorrow. And these are all thorny and they're just, nobody likes them. So I'm just tearing them out. And she's like, well, she was kind of grumpy. And then there's one of these portable basketball hoops next to it. You know, the kind that you can tip and roll and so she says, I want you to take that basketball hoop away. I said, well, that's not my basketball hoop. And some other neighbor, like, but I don't like it here. And the kids, the kids come down here and they play and they leave their balls all over and they're loud. And I was like, but that, this is a common street. Like, well, they shouldn't play here. And, and this, you need to take that basketball hoop to the dump. I said, but it's, it's not my basketball hoop. I can't take it. And she was just getting real frustrated with me. And at one point I said, do you know I, I mow your lawn? She's like, yeah, and then she just kind of glossed over that. She's like, well, I'm just going to have to call the police then. It's like, okay. <laughs> so she storms in the house, and I go back to pulling up these terrible bushes, and sure enough, an officer rolls down, and he comes over to me, and he's, he looks at what I'm doing. He's like, what are you doing here? I said, I'm just pulling out these evil bushes for the kids, and he was just kind of like, ugh. I got called here for that. You could just tell the, the frustration on his face. Like, are you serious? You're, you're landscaping in your neighborhood because you care. And so he goes to the lady, and she's all worked up. And, he's, and so he's almost scolding her. And in the process, she said, and the kids leave the balls in my yard, so I just take them. He's like, well, you know, actually, that is a crime. <laughs> so, so, uh, so anyways, he left super annoyed. I mean, I'm sure some horrible crime happened, but he was in there dealing with my landscaping. So, but the point was, it's actually super sad. Like this lady lives in the street. We try to reach out to her. She lives in a, a community with a bunch of people, some people even from my church. And uh, so it was just, it's just sad. Like she's no joy. She, she's angry at kids playing instead of happy. And, and so you know what that looks like. And I don't know her story. And she's sort of unfortunately kind of walled herself off from the neighborhood because that then became the story that she called the police on me for. And, and it's sad, no joy. There's a sense of bitterness. There's a sense of frustration that, uh, that you call the police on someone. And so we know what it doesn't look like. We don't want to be that grumpy, bitter, angry, life has beat me down, and, and that's, that's not a full life. That's not the life of knowing Jesus. So how do we have joy? How do we actually do that? How do we have joy? Why should we have joy? What does it really mean? What does it look like? Can we, where does that come from? So that's what we're going to explore today. That's what we're going to cover. And, um, and how do we have a consistent presence of joy and peace that you're okay even when life isn't? Right? How do we have joy when life isn't joyful? How do we have joy when life isn't working right? How do we do that? So that's also where we're going to get today. So the point I'm going to make is that true joy is in the Lord. True joy is in the Lord. So we're going to, we're going to get there today. So first of all, I'd like to know what we're talking about. What is joy? What is joy? Is it, it's not the caffeinated, too many energy drinks, bubbly co-worker, too many you know, f- forwarded meme, silly email. We're not, that's not joy, okay? That's irritating. That's uh, hyper, but that's not joy. You don't need caffeine. You don't need internet humor to have joy. So what are we talking about? What is, what is joy? So it, is, it means to be glad. To be glad. To have a sense of well-being. I'm good. Okay, I'm good. Doesn't necessarily mean life is good, but I'm good. I'm okay. It, it means to, to be merry. You probably don't use that word, but you're merry. You're, you're celebrating something. You're in, you're in good spirits about something. Um, it's also, it's not just an inward thing. It's not just something you have joy, but it sort of hides in you. It has expression. You share joy. You communicate joy with excitement. Um, it has the idea of festal joy. You're going, what? what are these words? Where did this guy come from Shakespeare? But this is the biblical word for joy, festal joy, meaning there's a large fire and meat involved. Okay, did anybody barbecue on the 4th of July? Just what happened? Are we in, what? Are we in America? No, you didn't have to grill out? I know it was the lame Wednesday, 4th of July, where it was, right, I got to work tomorrow. I'm not festal. I'm going to eat a sandwich. But normally... When you're joyful, we're in America, we're independent, we're blowing things up and setting things on fire. We're celebrating and there's meat being barbecued. There's festal joy, you're rejoicing. 
It's the disposition of the whole person, right? It, you, it fills you. You have a joy. It's expressed in your prayers. When you pray to God, you're rejoicing. You're often giving thanks. It's in your attitude, the way that you carry yourself. You have an attitude of joy. It's in your conversations, that you're bringing up things that you're celebrating, not just things that you're mourning. It's in your praise and your worship. Michael and the team up here, they, they started us off with a, a praise and worship joy. The 9 o'clock took them into the second song a little bit, but you guys are here. You're the 1030 group, so I'm expecting more joy. And um, it's even in shouting and dancing that there's a sense of, this is good. That's what joy is talking about. Some of you are clapping your hands. Some of you are like, yes, God is good. So that's what we're talking about here with joy. It's more than happiness. It's more than just happiness. Happiness is based on the facts, right? Happiness is based on the facts, things that are happening in life. You get the job, you're happy, right? You get the bonus check, you're happy. You get the news, yay, we're going to have a baby, you're happy. You get proposed to, you're engaged, we're happy. You get accepted to the college, you're happy, right? That's a circumstance. You lose the job, you're sad, right? You lose the kid, you're, you're really sad, right? The, the marriage breaks up, right? Those are happiness and sadness go with the facts of life. That was an 80s TV show. Anyways, uh, happiness is based on the facts, right? What's happening? Circumstances. And circumstances change. And circumstances are good and bad. You can have it in the same day. You can have a good morning and a bad evening, right? So that's what happiness goes up and down. It rides the waves of life. Joy is more enduring. Joy is focused on God, on what he has done, what he will do, and what is true. Right? Happiness is based on the facts, the circumstances. Joy is focused on God, what he has done, what he will do, and what is true. All right? So that's what we're talking about. Joy in the Lord, focused on God, his goodness, his truth, his, his work in our life, not the circumstances that go up and down. So I'm going to be in two passages today. If you want to turn to them, there's Philippians 3. I'm going to be in Philippians 3, 1 and Philippians 4, 4. So you can go old school. You can go new school. You can go, I don't want to move my hands and just look up. So, but I got them up there. So Philippians 3.1 and Philippians 4.4. 4. Philippians 3.1 says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me, and it is safe for you. Rejoice in the Lord. And Philippians 4.4 4 says basically the same thing. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. So both passages saying the same thing. And here's what you need to realize. It's a command. It's a command. The verbal tense is a command. You must rejoice. You know, we don't often like commands, but we give them, right? You tell your kids, you must clean that room. Go mow that lawn. Your boss gives them to you. Clean out that bathroom before you go home today, Right? Finish that stack of paperwork. Those are commands. This is what you're going to do. And here the command is you must rejoice. You don't see it in English, but that's, you could insert that word there. You must rejoice. You must rejoice in the Lord. You must always rejoice in the Lord. It's a command. You must do this. Now that seems a little bit odd. So I'll tell a story about that. I'm, I grew up here in Puyallup, and I went to Rogers. Are there any Rogers Rams in here? A few of you, yeah? I, I went to Rogers and... Uh, we resented Puyallup Vikings and still do, but there was no Emerald Ridge, so I have no context for that. I graduated in 95 from Rogers, and so my parents still live here, and then I moved up to Bellingham, went to Western, and never left. But in, uh, at Rogers, I took morning weight training, first period PE. I like that because I didn't have to get ready. I could just put on my gym shorts, go straight to PE, and then I was in the era where you actually showered at school. Nobody does that now. You're kind of a weird kid if you do that. But uh, So I would shower. So it kind of gave me, like, I could just wake up and roll straight to school, do weight training, shower. But we had a, our, our weight training coach was Coach Bogrand, and he wore the coach's short shorts. Do you know about the coach's short shorts? Polyester, 
two buttons, you know, more of the thigh than you wanted to see. That's what he wore every day, except they were blue. Um, so coaches short shorts, and I had morning weight training, and we were on a tight rhythm. You know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday was weight training. Tuesday and Thursday was conditioning, and we would do stair jumps and, you know, all horrible things. They're like, why, why did I take this again? But, um, but on certain Fridays in the spring, Coach Bogran would say, today we're playing softball, and you will have fun. <laughs> yep, okay, Coach, we will have fun. You know, otherwise, we'd just be running. So he commanded it, you will have fun. And we did, or else he'd make us run, right? So there's, but it's weird to say that. Have fun. You must be joyful. It feels like a pirate ship, right? We're going to start whipping until you're joyful. Can you tell people to be happy? Can you, can you command joy? Can you do that? Can you say be joyful? Can you, can, does that work? Is it something we muster up? But he does, right? Two passages. He says you must be joyful. So let me, um, let me show you why he does that. So in Philippians 3.1, he says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. He says, says, I don't mind writing this all day long. It's no trouble to write it again. And this is why I'm telling you, you must rejoice in the Lord. You must have joy in the Lord because it's safe. That means what is safe and sure, what is steadfast, solid, what is true. To rejoice in the Lord is what is safe and solid. Did anybody come into this room today and look up and go, you know, I'm not sure about these beams. I think this place is coming down. I'm going to sit underneath one of the white tile areas because those beams, did anybody think that? Nobody walked in and was kind of like, this building's not safe. I'm out of here. It's run by the fire department. So if they can't keep a building safe, something's wrong. I was slightly unsure about this, but um, so far I'm up here. But th- that's, this room is solid. Nobody came in here and thought the floor was going to fall out. No one came in here and thought the beams are coming down. This room is safe. It's sure. It's steadfast. It's here. It's true. Right? And, and that's what he's saying joy is for you. To rejoice in the Lord is what is safe, steadfast, true, solid, something that doesn't give way. And because um, a lot of things aren't that way. A lot of things aren't that way. Where's a lot of places we take our... Our, our grounding from is this whole, our whole culture of social media, right? You go on Instagram or Twitter or whatever you're on, and there you see, there's the person, oh, this, here's the new boat, and they got pictures, and like, yeah, boat, there, oh, here I am in Maui, you're like, I'm camping with mosquitoes, and there's my friend in Maui, yay for you, like, right? And you're seeing this, oh, look, here's my new wedding, and they're showing all the pictures, and everything looks amazing, and you're like, what? My life's not that way. But what it doesn't say is, maybe they're in absolutely crushing debt from that boat, but they want to look the part. Maybe someone is utterly depressed and hoping that a Maui trip will do it. It, it, You don't see that on Instagram. That's not written in the post. Terribly depressed, look at my life. That's not on there. It's like how awesome I are. Look at how cool my kids are. They all got soccer medals. And you're like, my kid sits down and eats grass, right? So... (laughs) You don't see the truth, right? If you're looking at what other people are doing, what other people have on social media, you don't know what's behind those pictures. They might have a difficult life. They might be hiding something. And it makes you go, well, look at them. And I'm not quite getting there. And I got to... And that's slippery slope. That's, that's, that's not solid. My family vacations on uh, Whidbey Island. And um, my family has a beach house there. I don't Anybody know where the, the ferry terminal is? Port Townsend Ferry Terminal. By Fort Casey, a couple people, the first service knew nothing. They're like, we'd be what? That's in Washington? It is, actually. There's an island, and on the, around the corner from the beach, there's some places where the winter winds will erode the bank, and a couple times, a house has come all the way down. Just someone's vacation home or regular home, I don't know, and there's not, it's not insurable. Right? There's no insurance for wave action. So a big storm comes, the bank's eroded, poof, your house is gone. It's not stable. It's not sure. It's not steadfast. And so we we assume a lot of things are. If I just had that job, if I just had that relationship, if I just looked that part, if I just had that gym membership, if I just got the right whatever, if I just got in the right relationship, if I looked like them, that would be sure and that would make me happy. But all those things are slippery. All those things can be yanked away. All those things often come with more heartache than joy. And so it's, it's slippery. But he says, if you rejoice in the Lord... 
That's true. That's solid. That doesn't shift. It doesn't change. God's not going anywhere. He's not going to abandon you. He's not going to leave you that joy in the Lord you can anchor your life on. Joy or happiness in circumstances can slip away. It can erode. It can go down that bank. It could even just not really be real. It looks real on the phone, but you don't, you don't see the backstory. So he's saying this is what's safe. This is what's true. This is what we build our life on. This is how we, we must rejoice. And that's why he commands it. You must rejoice in the Lord. Because if you put your hope and joy in anything else, it can slip. It can fail. So how can we do it? How do we rejoice in the Lord? How, how can that be done? And you see it again in both passages. He says, in the Lord. Philippians 3.1. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. He doesn't just say rejoice. He says, in the Lord. Second, the, the other passage, same thing, 4.4. 4, rejoice in the Lord. That's the focus. Rejoice in the Lord. Not in circumstances, not in life. In the Lord. And he commands it. You must do it because it's safe, because it's sure, because it's solid. But why does it have to be in the Lord? Right? Why does it have to be in the Lord? It's, it's the only way that you can rejoice. Right? It's the only way that you can rejoice. It's the only way you can have gladness. It's the only way you can raise your hands and praise the Lord Sunday by Sunday. It's the only way you can do it if you have it focused on the Lord. Because I don't know if you've noticed this, but life is actually pretty broken. Anybody in here experience brokenness? Anybody here's family not work right? Anybody here's body not work right? My wife's family's here today. We have four kids. Our oldest is a 14-year-old daughter. She's off at a horse camp in Cleelum. And then I have three boys. Boom, boom, boom. Everything's broken. Everything's destroyed. And stepping on Legos is a regular part of our household, just if you're wondering. Here's the trick. If you have a kid with Legos, if you scoot, <laughs> you don't step on them. So I kind of ice skate into my boy's room. But... Um, my number, my number two child, my oldest boy, when he was born, the doctors came to us and said, we think your son has Down syndrome. And so it was kind of a journey of, well, what does that mean? And well, how's our life going to change? And we really knew nothing about it. And um, some of you might have known a person with Down syndrome, been at your school or in your family. And many times people with Down syndrome are really joyful, love to be up front, love to get everybody going. My son is not that way. He does not want to be talked to. He does not want the focus of attention. He's, he's not usually happy. Some things are funny about that because people will come up and talk to him and he'll go like this. And they think he's kind of waving, but it's actually the sign language for I'm all done. You know, so he's like, whoop, I'm all done. Like, oh, he waved. Yes, he waved at you. But, um, <laughs> but it's actually changed every moment of our life. Uh, when he was able to move, he was a walking wrecking ball. We, we go to anybody's house, any glass, any plate on any service, surface was whoosh, gone. So if we went to somebody's house, one of us followed him, one of us enjoyed the party. Right? And, and even still, he was hard to stop. Even still, he could get to a glass before you could think. He'd pull people's glasses off. Um, so it was just, it was just, we thought we could hire him out. If you want to know how to child-proof your house, like, well, here, borrow him from an hour. He'll show you all the weak spots, and you're good. But... <laughs> And I can laugh more now, but it was, we just stopped going. We stopped going to people's houses, which is hard when you're a pastor, right? And you want to connect to people. So we stopped um, for a period. Of, there was a period of years where we didn't sleep through the night at all. He'd be up through the night. The only way was to be on his floor. And the longer you lay on someone's floor in the middle of the night, the more you just almost become mad. So, that was, so it was years without sleep. Uh, I don't know how many times I've scrubbed garments in the toilet that were soiled just to get them clean. That's not a very pleasant experience. And the hardest has been the schooling. He just doesn't fit. Uh, if some of you have a person in your life with special needs, it's so hard to make schooling work. We've had homeschooling, we've had private schooling, back to homeschooling, public schooling, private schooling, back to public schooling, just trying to make something work. We've had two teachers really believe in him and he's excelled, but the rest, it's been very difficult. And most of it's behavior. Right? He, can, he can turn a school upside down in seconds and run away. You wouldn't believe the amount of things he can get into a toilet. And the whole thing just comes breaking down. But the scene that just kind of all came home, I went to the school. He's in a separate room. 
uh, and inside that separate room, there's a little safe room that he'll go in, and if it gets really bad, they hold a button on the outside so he can't get out uh, until he's calm. And so I arrive at school to pick him up. There's two adults fully gowned up and gloved up. My son is in this room, no clothes on, pee on the floor, and they're explaining to me what happened. And I was like in a daze. Like, I, I have no answer for this. Like, they're this way, and, this, and they're, they're working hard, but it's your kid. Like, what do you do when you go to school, and there's these two adults who are dealing with this, and I have nothing to tell them, I don't know the solution, I don't know how to help it, and it's your kid, and I was just sort of in a fog. Like, I don't, I don't know what to say. We're working with a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a behavior team, medic- and we're doing everything that's humanly available, both privately and publicly funded, and it's super hard. Fortunately, this summer we're seeing some improvements. Last summer, he was a walking wrecking ball. You couldn't take your eye off him. He's 12, right? You expect that when someone's two. When they're 12, they're faster, more destructive, and it's 10 times harder. So that's our story, right? This has changed. We don't, we don't go on the vacations that people go on. Like Disneyland would be a nightmare for us, right? And so, but our friends go. We're thankful that our family has a, a place that we can go. That, so we, we go there and we're thankful for that. But we see, we don't go out to dinner unless it's taco time because he has a special food. That's all he'll eat. So we just, it, it's just, everything's different. The only time it's comfortable is when we go to someone else's house who has special needs. I travel with special needs or they come over because then you're like, oh, we totally understand. If they destroyed that, phew, that's normal for us. So that's like the only time you let down is when you're with other people that have someone with special needs in their life. That's just our story. Life is broken. If I was to be joyful based on the circumstances of my life, it would be very hard because it can change in a day. You can start with a good morning and have a, a bad one. So that's why he says, rejoice in the Lord. Because what I, I guess I'm a pastor, so I'm involved in many people's lives, marriages, their troubles. And what we've just, my wife and I have concluded is that everybody has special needs. It might not include an extra chromosome, but it's something. You have a special needs because you're dealing with an aging parent. And they have, their, you know, their mind is shifting. And so that's dominant. Like, what do we do with grandma? Right? That could be your special needs. It could be that you have a, a, a teenager that's just totally rebelled from the family. It could be you have a job situation that's just unbearable. I don't know what it is. Everybody has a special need going on. And if you don't have one now, there probably will be one. Life is broken. So when you're talking about being joyful and, and joyful, it can't be happiness. Because it goes up and down, right? We had no idea that day he was born, our whole rest of our life, and it's going to be the rest of our life. He's not going off to college, right? It's, it's different. So we have to rejoice in the Lord, in the Lord. So let me show you this. In 1 Peter 1, 3, 9, this is what I'm talking about when I say rejoice in the Lord. And you must rejoice because it's safe, it's sure, it's solid, it's not going to shift, it's not going to change. So it's in 1 Peter 1, 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's the gospel. That God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. And when you trust Christ, you're born again. You're new. You're a new person. Sin's forgiven. And it says, and you have a living hope. That you're hoping, you're looking to the future, verse 4, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. That when you're in Christ, you have a future to look forward to, that there's an inheritance for you, there's eternal life, there's a place for you, there's rewards for you that don't perish, that don't fade, that aren't soiled, that aren't taken away, that can't be ruined. That that's your hope. You're looking to what the Lord has for you. Verse 5 said, who by God's power are being guarded. And God's even guarding you. Through faith, right, you continue to trust him for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Your salvation in Christ is guarded by him. It's protected. It can't be taken away. It can't be ruined. It can't be corrupted. And verse 6 is, in this you rejoice, right? We rejoice in our salvation, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So rejoice in the Lord because your life becomes grieved by trials. Verse 7 says, So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. There's a lot of 
thinking out there that if I come to Jesus and I go to church and I give some money and I get involved, then it's a one-to-one. The blessings start coming and the checks start coming and the, all the diagnoses are my way and I never get sick. And no one. That's not real. What's real is that your faith gets tested, that life has full of trials. And your faith, are you in it because of God and who he is? Or are you in it because of what I might get? And there's a lot of teaching out there that's like that. You do this, God owes you. But the reality is God's given you life, salvation is protected, and your faith will be tested. Do I trust him when it's bleak? Do I trust him when it's dark? And it says when you do, it's found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Christ. That he saves you by his grace. He, he protects you with, through the trials. And then when you hang on to him and he appears one day, there's praise, glory, and honor. He cheers for you. And you're like, wait, all I did was hang on maybe by fingernails. So let's go to uh, this one, true joy is in the Lord. True joy is in the Lord. And so let me show you how it works. This is, this is the gospel. I want you to see this to see how you can rejoice in trial, how you can hang on to your faith. I want you to see and, and understand what the Lord Jesus Christ has done in uh, the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. It says, um, Hebrews 12, 1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, that's all of chapter 11, all these heroes of the faith, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so close. Picture like heavy, wet clothes on you. Like, I'm going to get this off and let us run with endurance the race that is set before. He's like, I want you to keep running your race of life. And how do we do that? And how do we do it with joy? Verse 2, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. It says that there was a joy before him that caused him to endure the cross. If the Romans wanted you dead, they could have cut your head off. But the Romans said, we want to make a way where you die in such a way that it's horrific and filled with shame. So the cross was devised. It was a slow, painful death being nailed to a wooden cross like a piece of meat, and you were stripped naked so that not only were you dying a slow, horrible, painful death, you were utterly shamed and humiliated. As if to say, look, Look at this horrible, despicable, worthless human being that we're hanging up like meat to die a shame-filled death. If they just wanted you dead, they could have done that in seconds. No, they wanted you to suffer physically and suffer emotionally, suffer humiliation of the worst kind. And here is that he despised that. So we're like, you know what? I'm going to take all of that. We despise that shame. You cannot shame me. You cannot do enough to stop me. Why? The joy. That was set before him. He was looking through the cross, through the shame, to the other side where there was joy. What's the joy? What's the joy that prompted Jesus to endure that kind of torment and death, humiliation, abandoned by the Father for our sin? What's joy on the other side of that? Some guess, well, it's the joy of pleasing God the Father. We realize he already pleased God the Father. When Jesus was baptized, God's voice came from heaven and said, This is my Son with whom I'm well pleased. Right? Jesus, he already had the full pleasure of the Father from eternity past. This is my son whom I love. Eternity future, he's given the name above every name. The, the joy of the Father, he had that. He always has. He's always obeyed. The joy was bringing you home. Sin separates you. Sin brings death. And, and the fallen world, he had this plan from all time to rescue his fallen kids who are enslaved to sin and death forever. And he said, for the joy of bringing them home, for the joy of undoing the effects of sin, for the joy of rescuing my lost children, I will go through the worst kind of death, the worst kind of shaming, and the abandonment of God the Father for the joy of you. The joy of you. That's pretty huge. That's pretty huge. So when you're in life and you're saying, okay, I'm going through life and I've got a whole mess. If you don't have one now, there's going to be one or you've come out of one. I'm a whole mess and circumstances go up and down and we don't know what tomorrow's going to bring and you don't know when the next time you go to the doctor and they say, guess what, bad news. You don't know when you're going to get that horrible note, I'm gone. All right, you don't know. Maybe it's already happened. And how do you have joy? Just like Jesus was looking to the cross, looking beyond the cross to the joy, you look, say, Jesus gives me joy. 
and you're looking beyond whatever you're facing. That's what we do, right? When I'm scrubbing, when I'm up at night, when I'm picking my kid up from school and it's horrible, there's this joy that's saying, you know, someday he'll be healed. Someday. It will be that way. Someday it'll be, it'll be perfectly normal in heaven. Someday you'll be healed. Someday your inheritance will be there forever, protected by God. So right now you might not have joy, but in the Lord you know what's coming. You know there's a healing. You know there's a hope. You know there's a health. There's a fixing of everything. There's a righting of all the wrongs. So if you have true joy, you're not looking right here. You're looking beyond. I had a moment the other day driving the car. Nothing to do with anything. I was just driving down the freeway. And it just was revealed in my heart, I'm bitter about this. Like I'm, I'm still mad about chromosome number 47, right? I'm still mad about that one little thing that changes everything. And I just had to let it go. Like he said, got it. It can't change. It's not going anywhere. Nothing's going to happen. I just had to say, you don't have to let it go. Joy's in the Lord. There's joy before me. There's joy in heaven. There's joy what God will do. You can't hold that bitterness. You've got to let it go. So true joy is in the Lord. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what you're looking at. It may be something that's not solvable. It may be something you're going to live the rest of your days with. It may be something that gets worse. And you say, how do I have joy? How do I come in here and praise the Lord? How do I go to work? And you're not pretending like everything is okay. Someday everything will be okay. Because in the Lord, it's going to be okay. And that's where you rejoice. And that's how you put up your hands. And that's how you pray. And that's how you get up every day. That's how you face the trial. It's not happiness. It's not fake. It's not social media. It's safe. It's solid. It's sure as the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the Lord. So let me suggest some responses for you today. Uh, I'm going to be down here. Some others from the prayer team will be down here. If you just want to be prayed for, maybe you're just like, I don't even see the light at the end of the tunnel. I'm happy to pray for you over here. I understand. Um, Maybe this week you set up a way to remember. Maybe you put Hebrews 12.2 in your phone on a daily pop-up. And whenever it starts getting rough, you just go, wait, the joy set before Jesus, and there's joy set before me. And you just, you got to remind yourself. Perhaps some of you are here and you don't even know the joy of Jesus. You're just slugging through life, hoping for some good circumstances. And I'd love for, uh, for you to take a step further in understanding Jesus, understanding the gospel. How do you trust him? How do you have that joy and hope? There's a place you can mark on these connection cards. The bottom right says you want to say yes to Jesus. Or even if you just want to ask questions, fill that out. And someone here from Whitewater will get in touch with you about that. You can put on the back, there's prayer requests. Maybe you need some people praying for you. Maybe you're bearing a load nobody knows about. So don't, don't leave here alone. Don't leave here unprayed for. Don't leave here without thinking, you know, I need to do something. I need to take a step today. Uh, that These options are available. And during the songs, I'll be down here. I'd love to pray for you. Any, you don't even have to voice it. You don't even have to say what's happening. You just say, pray for me. And tell me your name, and I'll pray for you right there. Why don't we pray right now? Lord Jesus, we just thank you that you endured the cross. That through the horrific death, and the shame and the abandonment, you, you despise that. You said, I'll go right through that to bring home my kids. Give us a joy on the other side of this life. We're not, necess- we're not bearing sin and death. We're not bearing the sins of the world. But we're bearing the hurts and the hang-ups and the pain and the brokenness of this world that's under a curse. And we need hope. We need joy. Give each one here a sense of abiding joy that they look forward and go, whatever's happening now will be healed. Whatever's broken here will be healed. That's imperishable, undefiled, it's kept in heaven, we're guarded. Give us a genuine faith to hang on to you, even by a fingernail. Let's pray for any in this room who are just holding on by a fingernail. This is a bruised reed you will not break. You will not turn them away. I pray for this church community to support one another. to encourage one another, <laughs> to heal the sound system. And, uh, but you'd give this church a whole a heart for this community. You'd reach the Puyallup Valley and beyond, the communities around here, north, south, east, and west. Would you just reach more and more people and bless the ministry of Whitewater. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.